Let's look at lance versus sword. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatore. So recently, um, a comment came up under one of my previous videos where I was talking about, about late period British cavalry swords. This is the 1908. Believe it or not, this is still current regulation if we were still doing cavalry charges. So if you look at kind of um, Trooping of the Colour or modern sort of parade events, you'll still see that they use this model of sword. Um, I won't call it a sabre because it's not curved, but I realise that in some parts of the world, for example, America and France, this would be a, a sabre or sabre. Um, regardless, anyway, it's a cavalry sword. And this was the last model, uh, this is the reason it's still uh, regulation today, is it was the last model of uh, cavalry sword really except for the officer's version in 1912 to be introduced into the British military and these were used contrary to popular belief uh, unless you've seen the movie War Horse these were used extensively in World War One and in some cases quite successfully there's some really quite big cavalry actions in World War One and uh, what a lot of people don't know is there were some quite big cavalry actions after World War One as well because in certain parts of the world whether it was policing or campaigning, uh, for example, the um, campaign in Afghanistan in 1919, obviously the year after World War One ended, um, there were there was cavalry uh, movements, cavalry uh, manoeuvres. Uh, equally, in the 1920s, there were certain actions in various parts of the world. Uh, and of course, if we fast forward all the way to World War Two, there were some quite big cavalry actions in Eastern Europe as well. Um, and then, if we dive back to World War One again, there were some very big scale cavalry actions actions um, partly in Europe as I've just spoken about but also in North Africa as well um, uh, between the Ottoman Turks and the uh, Arab army under Lawrence and others and so on and so forth. So basically there were lots of cavalry actions in the 20th, 20th century even if they weren't necessarily uh, sort of history changing. But when we talk about the 20th century and indeed in the historical sources you'll notice I'm struggling a bit to handle this uh, spear. It is because I don't own a cavalry lance so this is close as I've got to it. Um, the, when we're talking about the 20th century the question often comes up sword versus lance and this is a question that they asked a lot in period and as I understand it in World War One, for example the uh, German forces and I think possibly the Austrians, although I'm not sure about that, uh, went to pretty much just using uh, um, lances at a certain point. Uh, so they pretty much gave up with swords. Um, and certainly, if I just put the sword down for a second, um, one of the overall questions has to be is if the lance is so effective, why did people, why didn't they just, why didn't everyone use them? So clearly the lance is cheaper to make, simpler to make, quicker to make, uh, you can, uh, you've got a longer reach with it. Um, other advantages, particularly if you're um, engaging on horseback, you're engaging people on foot with a rifle and a bayonet, you can stab them from further away than they can stab you. Uh, equally, if you're facing other cavalry and say they've got swords and you've got lances, you will hit them a long time before they're even in distance to hit you. Um, so, you know, on paper, you would kind of think that the, the lance would just completely dominate. And certainly if we look at uh, medieval knights or pretty much anyone, uh, or a lot of people from history, cavalry forces did use lances as their primary weapon. Um, now, they do come with some disadvantages, and we've looked at these in previous videos. Uh, you will see that I've done previous videos actually with a horseman friend of mine, Zach Evans, where we've actually looked at um, lance on horseback a a against the person fighting on foot. In that case, it was where they've got a pole axe or whatever. Um, and you will notice that one of the big disadvantages of the lance is that you can track a person a long way around on this side, on for a right-handed per, right person on the left-hand side, but it's not so easy on the right-hand side. Although, as Zach showed, you can still turn quite a long way around here, but you become mechanically weaker to do so. And in fact, there is a technique where you take the lance out, oh, I'm a bit constricted for space here, and you stick it under this shoulder to actually keep tracking around that way. But obviously that's a little bit fiddly and requires a bit more uh, thinking uh, to do. So by and large, they can be more limited on angle than a sword is because clearly a sword can defend and even attack pretty much at 360 degrees all the way around when you're sitting in the saddle. 
Um, in terms of defensive, that's in defensive terms, that's the other thing, is that this is a great weapon of offense, but it's not fantastic in defense. You're kind of relying, it's a bit like a gun, you're relying on taking out the opponent before they get in range to hit you back. If you run this lance or miss, if you run this lance through a part of someone and it doesn't kill them or stop them or knock them off their horse, or indeed if you miss with it, they're now here and you're holding a large stick, the point of which is now miles away. Yes, indeed, you can now, you could disengage it and try and shorten it and use it at closer range in various different ways or change the grip on it and things like this. You could potentially hang, and again, I've limited the space, but you can potentially put some blocks in using the lance. And in fact, there's a technique, in fact, a couple of uh, medieval treatises show techniques where the lance is actually used to defend like this. This incidentally <coughs> will work against other lances as well. If there's a lance coming in, then as a last ditch defense, you can uh, knock the point of the opponent's lance aside with this end of the weapon, or indeed you can beat it aside with your own weapon here in the same way, a bit like a giant uh, foil or small sword or rapier. So you can do some basic fencing maneuvers with the blade or shaft of the weapon itself. The other point that often comes up as well is what happens when these weapons, whether it's a sword or a lance, go into the target. Now, funnily enough, the answer's the same for both of them, um, with one exception. Now, there are certain types of, um, uh, shall we call them, disposable lances that break on impact. So many of you will have seen jousting displays, or indeed you might have seen jousting in period art, where you can see they use a big old fat jousting lance and it kind of explodes on impact or breaks on impact. Um, that's one way of dealing with the fact that your point potentially has gone into the target, but you're still traveling past them. Uh, so in that case, the shaft destroys itself and you've now lost your lance. At that point, it becomes very important to have some type of sword or backup weapon or uh, someone following you along with other lances. And believe it or not, this did happen. People did ride around with spare lances and hand them to the, to the knight or man at arms uh, to replace their current one with. But generally speaking, throughout history, most spears and lances used from horseback are repeated use weapons, just like a sword is, and essentially you have to practice your extraction techniques, okay? So if we're on our horseback and we hit someone uh, with the lance point here, okay, what we have to practice doing is as you go past, you let the thing go past and out, you carry on riding, you extract it out, and then, and then you, reset your, uh, you reset your lance. If it's going down low, then you do it that way. And if you look up tent pegging videos, you can see this kind of thing. If it's going on this side, then as it goes into the target, you basically, and again, because I'm not sitting on a high up horse here and there's ground down here, uh, you basically let it go back and that way. And I'll just use my arm all the way through there. Again, if you look on YouTube, you can see tent pegging or skillet arms. You can see these things being practiced. It's actually easier for me to demonstrate with a sword because obviously a sword is a lot shorter. So in here, it basically goes through there or across there. If you go in here, it either goes around and out that way or if it's pointed down low, then through there. So uh, once the thing, once the point has gone into the target, you go past the target, you swing the arm through and you let it extract out. That's the theory anyway. However, we do know that sometimes when these points, whether it's with a sword or a lance, went into the opponent, it did knock the weapon out of the user's hand. For this reason, uh, this isn't the only reason, and I'll expand on this in a second, it was extremely common for anyone using a lance to also have a sword as a backup, okay? Now, uh, as, I, as promised a second ago, Another reason why it's important to um, have a backup is melee, okay? Now, as I've alluded to, the lance is a somewhat awkward weapon as soon as you get into a more static or melee type situation whereby there's opponents all around you and you're having to attack and defend a lot within a small area and a small period of time. And the lance isn't great at doing that. Um, the lance is great when you're on the move. It's great for hit and run. Um, 
It's great for hitting the opponent before, you know, so they're out of reach of you. It's great for attacking infantry, so they can't just stab you back with the thing that they're holding quite so easily. There were certain, obviously, Polish lances used particularly long lances against pike blocks, believe it or not, in the 17th century. So, absolutely, the lance is a great weapon, but when you get into close-in fighting, then a sword is a useful, more useful thing. Not, incidentally, necessarily the 1908 uh, pattern sword. What we're going to do now here is go to a completely different area and uh, period of history. My God, it's awkward doing a video with a lance in a room. Uh, right, so here we go to the Chinese Han Dynasty specialised cavalry sword. You'll notice in this case, it's actually got a forwards curve on it, which we won't explore too much in this video. I have done a video about these before. And this is, as you can see, it's a cut and thrust sword. Clearly you can thrust with it because it's got a point. It's really very long for its era, exceptionally long in fact. Uh, but it, it also has a forwards curve and a sharp edge, so you can cut with it. Now, cutting, it, as you may realise, uh, and the ability to move the sword around quickly in any direction and protect any part of you is really useful in a close-in melee situation. So the sword isn't only useful as a backup to the um, lance or spear when it gets lost or broken or stuck in an opponent or whatever, but also it's advantageous in certain situations where we're essentially confined by space or by fighting environments. So you're having to, uh, you know, you've got multiple opponents that you've got to deal with from all different angles and places all the way around, okay? So the sword definitely comes into its own in that scenario and has an advantage over the lance. So hopefully in fairly concise terms, I've shown some of the advantages of the lance and some of the reasons why you might want to use a lance rather than the sword. But equally, I've shown some situations where you might choose to use the sword rather than the lance. But overall, through most of history, a lot of cavalry forces have used the lance initially and then have had a sword as backup. So that essentially they're using the advantages of the lance as, as long as they are advantages, and when they cease to be either available because the lance is broken or stuck or lost, um, or when the, those advantages no longer exist, then you go to the sword because the sword now presumably has greater advantages over that lance. So we come back to the question of why would cavalry not use a lance and why would they only have a sword or only have a sword as their hand weapon? And that's a very interesting question that I've mulled over a little bit. Why, for example, did most British cavalry in World War I use one of these swords, but they didn't have a lance? It's not to say that there weren't some uh, British cavalry with, um, with lances. There were. There were. Particularly Indian cavalry had lances. Um, uh, so there absolutely were British cavalry which were lances and had a lance and a sword or in some cases only a lance. So why didn't everyone, why didn't everyone carry lances? And I think overall, the answer is this, firearms, <laughs> okay? So coming all the way back to the beginning of this video, we talked about the fact that cavalry still had a role in the 20th century, but the, the overall impression of people is that cavalry weren't very useful in the 20th century, because of firearms. But the irony is that one of the most useful things that cavalry did in the 20th century was to be a mobile deployment force of shooters, okay? So if we look at World War I, yes, absolutely, the sword was used for full-on charges. Absolutely, the sword was used in attacking artillery positions and machine gun nests and this kind of stuff. Yes, it was used for that. But cavalry as a whole, apart from scouting around, which was an incredibly important role on the battlefield, uh, and going ahead of a, a marching force to you know, scout out the area and find out where there might be pockets of uh, enemy or whatever, apart from scouting and occasionally using the sword, one of the most important aspects for 20th century cavalry was to ride to a place, dismount, shoot at the enemy, while some other force did something else, then mount up and move on quickly somewhere else. So the fact that they used firearms in the, really, going all the way back to the 17th century or 16th century, was very, very important to cavalry. So, lances, 
in the uh, ancient world and most of the medieval world absolutely with a primary cavalry arm but as soon as you have the ability to give cavalry firearms whether it's pistols carbines or rifles arquebuses whatever they've got blunderbusses in some cases shotguns in some cases with uh, confederate cavalry or revolvers Whatever firearms they've got, it means that the sword, they, if they still need a hand weapon, the sword is the go-to because it can be worn. You cannot wear a lance. So it comes back to this point um, that I often make in rebuttal to people who go, oh, well, spears, spears the king of weapons, Every, spear beats everything one-on-one -on -one fight, and spear's more useful as a battlefield weapon. Yes, that's true but you can't take a spear everywhere, okay? Spears aren't very useful um, below decks in ships. They're not very useful in sieges once you're inside a castle. They're not very useful in tunnels, you know? So there are all, uh, they're not very useful clearing out buildings in a town. There are all sorts of situations where a sword is a more practical and beneficial weapon than a spear is. Similarly on horseback, if your priority is to be a quickly mobile force, a quickly reacting force that can scout, sometimes shoot, sometimes deliver a cavalry charge, sometimes attack, attack some pocket of resistance or flee, uh, chase a fleeing enemy, then a sword is a better sidearm because you can wear it until you need it, you can use your firearm more freely, um, and you're not encumbered by a lance. You can't really put a lance down or put it on your back like in Bannerlord or stow it in a holster in the way that you can do with either a firearm or a sword. So sidearms, which lances are not really, sidearms are more useful to the cavalryman in lots of periods since, since the 16th century where firearms and swords are used in conjunction. And that's one of the reasons that you don't simply choose a lance all the time. I hope this has been thought provoking. If you've got other thoughts, then uh, post below. I'll have a look there. Maybe it'll give me some ideas for future videos. If you're not uh, subscribed, please consider doing so. And um, I've currently got COVID, so I've struggled to get through this video. So I hope you've made it this far. Um, but I will see you soon on the channel for another video. And uh, take care, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.